Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the next in the series of NCAR's coronavirus briefings. Uh, we've been doing these uh, at the pace of about one or two a week. This is the first one for this week. And we are uh, very much at the core of uh, the key questions that confront us in this unprecedented crisis that the Indian economy, Indian society, and all of us Indians are facing. Very appropriately, we've labeled this webinar uh, the path towards a safe, sensible, and clear exit strategy to allow us to rebuild the economy. And I'm uh, very pleased that we have four experts with their um, eyes and ears to the ground, uh, yet uh, very specialized in their own economic spheres, to guide us and to uh, tell us their thinking about how India can be on such a path uh, so as to be able to rebuild the economy. Uh, this is going to be the deepest recession that perhaps the world has seen in modern times. And every day that we remain locked down is proving to be obviously very expensive. Uh, workers are uh, depleting their savings. Businesses are going to build up debts. Uh, employers are being, employees are being laid off uh, and workforce being reduced. Uh, migrants are returning back to their home and possibly with grave reservations about returning back to the urban occupations that they were manning. So every day produces more danger for the economy and a harder path up uh, to a recovery. At the same time, uh, doing away with a lockdown early will also have economic costs of its own. Health risks will remain, and many employees may not feel comfortable who are in such a position, may not feel comfortable to return to their workplaces. They will then face a terrible choice, either putting their health at risk or uh, not showing up for work and being removed from work. Similarly, uh, there are likely to be consequences on the demand side where uh, Households and others may not feel able to spend in the expectation of the grave uncertainty that still lies uh, ahead and may want to be saving uh, much more. Uh, and of course, the biggest risk is that the virus could reemerge uh, with a second and a third wave of infection. So these are some of the very large and difficult choices that lie ahead. Uh, with that uh, uh, introduction, I want to uh, uh, welcome our four panelists. Uh, Abhik Parwa, who is the chief economist of uh, an executive vice president of HTFC Bank. He was earlier the chief economist of ABN AMRO and the India economist for Merrill Lynch. He's been a member of uh, RBI Monetary Policy Committee and the industry monitoring group at RBI, and he writes for the Business Standard and Economic Times. Uh, he's been twice post voted the best forecaster among domestic banks by Bloomberg. We also have the privilege of having on this webinar Sajid Chinoy, JP Morgan's chief India economist. Uh, he serves on the advisory council of the 15th Finance Commission, has been a consultant to the FRBM review committee that proposed a new fiscal anchor for the economy. He's worked at the IMF in Washington and was a senior associate at McKinsey prior to that. Uh, he has been part of the process that led to inflation targeting for India, and he's been ranked as one of the best individual in research in India by Asset Magazine. Third, we have uh, Shantan Hussain Gupta, the head of Treasury Economics and Strategy at Reliance Industries. He was earlier senior investment strategist at Copal Partners and he started his career with Goldman Sachs, working in Hong Kong with investment strategy across their entire platform. And finally, uh, we have Sonal Verma, who is in Singapore, joining us from Singapore. She is the chief India economist for Nomura Holdings. Her responsibilities include analyzing India, of course, but also Asia's global markets. Uh, and she's part of the research team based outside of Japan. Uh, she's been uh, with Lehman Brothers uh, earlier, and has worked at ICICI and Crystal. She was rated number one on research in India from 2012 to 2015 by Asset Magazine, among many other awards that she has won. So that's a great group that we have together. 
This is a market focus group that is deeply concerned about how markets are performing or not performing, the implications for their clients, but also implications for the entire environment in which we work. Uh, with that introduction, I'm going to request Sajid Chinoy to lead us off uh, with a view of uh, the global economy in particular, something that he pays attention to and JP Morgan pays a lot of attention to. And then we'll request after that, uh, we'll request Sonal Verma to give us a macro perspective. Thereafter, Shantanu to give an industry and corporate perspective, including on supply chains, which of course is central to modern economies. And finally, at the foundation of it all, uh, we'll turn to Abhik Barua on his assessment of the financial sector and the way in which we may be able to continue to finance a recovery. With that, let me turn to Sajid Chinoy. Uh, thank you very much, Shekhar. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be on here this evening. Uh, you know, uh, as you, I think the word unprecedented has become a little bit trite, uh, but it need, it bears repetition here because what we're seeing play out here is truly unprecedented on a number of dimensions, right? Um, I think rarely can we think of a situation where the trade-off between lives and livelihoods around the world has been as acute and as stark as we're seeing right now. But purely from the economic perspective, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the sheer depth and the breadth of what we're seeing, uh, you know, hasn't been seen, we believe, in the last hundred years. Um, economic forecasts will keep changing. Uh, there's a huge quantum of uncertainty and the standard deviation around any such forecast that is large and therefore, you know, point forecasts are not meaningful. But the orders of magnitude that we're talking about are now two, two and a half times what we saw in the global financial crisis. So, you know, most investment banks, JP Morgan, for example, believes that global growth uh, in 2020 is going to be you know, more than twice as deep in terms of a contraction compared to what we saw in 2008, right? So this is a very large pothole that we're facing. It's not just, so I think you know, uh, comparisons with 2008 are slightly misplaced. One really has to go back to the Great Depression to see uh, growth contractions as deep and large as this. I mean, we forecast the US economy is gonna contract almost 8% this year. Uh, Western Europe, almost 7%. These are very large contractions. It's not just the depth, though. It's the breadth uh, of what's happening, uh, which, is, which is truly worrisome. Uh, the IMF recently came out with its forecast in the World Economic Outlook, and they believe that 170 countries, no less than that, will see lower per capita incomes in, uh, in 2020. So this is very deep, and this is very broad. Now, there are three presumptions by which I think uh, JP Morgan thinks about what's happening. One is, as I said, a very sharp uh, drop off in growth. But the second is on the other side of the pandemic, uh, an equally sharp response, because a lot of this is behavioral induced. Just think of what's going to happen uh, to aggregate demand once the lockdowns end, you know, a few months from now, hopefully, and people can go back. So I think the recovery will be as sharp at some level because unlike a natural calamity, there's no lost physical capital here. But despite that, what we believe at the end of 2021, there will be a permanent loss. So if you look at you know, GDP growth over the next eight quarters and compare it to what we were thinking before the COVID shock, there is a large permanent loss to output in the next two years, as best we can forecast. And the estimates uh, bottom up are, you could lose almost 9% of GDP in foregone output because of this shock. So, you know, these things sit une uneasily with each other that A, it's a very deep contraction. B, you may well see a strong recovery once lockdowns end, and yet it will not be a complete recovery because you will have permanently lost output uh, over the next two years. Um, the other element of all of this globally is just the policy response. I mean, what's unprecedented nature is the size and the speed of what we are seeing from policymakers. I, I take the US as an example. Uh, I mean, the US Fed has gone from being uh, the lender of last resort to the banking system to essentially becoming almost a lender of first resort to the broader economy. It's behaving like a commercial bank. And it's doing so precisely because there's an acute recognition among uh, policymakers around the world that the hysteresis from the shock will depend crucially on how much this amplifies. Will there be an amplification in, uh, 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 in financial markets? And will there be an amplification in labor markets? If that amplification exists, then you will have second down impacts that are equally uh, prolonged. 
And so I think one goal of all central banks has been try and minimize the bankruptcies in small, medium enterprises. Because if there are bankruptcies, then you get the amplification. Then you get high non-performing assets in the financial system, which becomes risk averse. Then you get a lot of unemployment, which means that uh, precautionary savings may go up down the road. So and I think that's the underpinned a lot of the policy response around the world, that you're seeing a lot of credit guarantees in the financial system. And that's being done uh, to ensure that the financial sector is backstopped by fiscal authorities that uh, lending that is so crucial to ensuring that a liquidity problem does not become a solvency problem for small medium enterprises actually happens. So I think you're seeing a two-pronged two approach uh, by central banks. One is of course, ease financial conditions, slash interest rates, inject a lot of liquidity, make sure markets, all markets have liquidity, but secondly, also work with fiscal authorities to ensure that uh, uh, credit is flowing uh, to the most vulnerable uh, from the shock, which otherwise would not have gone without those fiscal backstops and without those credit guarantees. And this seems to be the typical playbook in developed markets. These numbers are large. The US fiscal deficit is 10% of GDP, unprecedented. Uh, the Europeans have got credit guarantees in the 15 to 30% range. So I think that's the global backdrop that we're working with. Uh, a, a very large shock, but an unprecedented policy response. So let me kind of wrap up initial comments by saying, what does this all mean for emerging markets, right? And it's, I think it's easy to transplant what um, developed economies are doing and say, you know, emerging markets should have the same kind of response, you know, fiscal deficits in the five to 10% range, you must mechanic, the fiscal must mechanically make up what aggregate, the loss in aggregate demand from the private sector. And that's just not possible to do. The fact is emerging markets, all of them don't have the, exorbitant privilege that some developed economies enjoy. Uh, 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 they don't have the reserve currencies. Uh, they have to be mindful about uh, uh, capital outflow pressures, uh, in, investor perceptions, and ratings agencies. So I think when we talk about the emerging market response, what's doubly uh, 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 crucial or constraining for them is you've got a shock that's perhaps even more magnified because there are more low-income low families uh, in, uh, in emerging markets and the consequences of them could be large, but you cannot respond in the same way as developed markets because in a way you're forced to respond with one hand behind your back. What that means is policy interventions in emerging markets in India will have to be exceptionally intelligent. If you're constrained by how much fiscal space you have, a monetary space you have, then you have to use that uh, 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 most efficiently. And I would argue, and I'll conclude by this, that in India, for example, if, if, if fiscal space is not unlimited, and in other emerging markets, you will have to see wartime-like prioritization, where the focus will have to be to use precious fiscal resources, first on the health fight, because it's only if you win the health fight can we talk about uh, lives and livelihoods. It will have to be uh, humanitarian support for low-income families. It will have to be support for small medium enterprises to preserve them, to ensure there isn't rampant bankruptcy, and then you lose the human capital and institutional capital, and it'll have to be to backstop the financial sector to make sure there's no amplification uh, from the COVID shock. So it's an unenviable position that policymakers in emerging markets find themselves in. But Shekhar, I'll stop there with initial comments. Thank you, Sajid. Uh, and what you just said about the various ways in which policy will have to respond is perhaps even more amplified in India simply because of the large size of the informal sector. So it's, it's the medium and small enterprises, but it's also the one home person, home enterprise that we are also deeply concerned about. And I hope we can come back to that. May I turn to Sonu Verma to give us a sense of the overall macro picture that India is experiencing and can really think about for uh, the next few months as we proceed on this in this crisis. So no, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, so let me actually focus on uh, two things. Uh, one is, uh, you know, uh, how to think about uh, this uh, crisis, uh, because the macro policy response that uh, India implements uh, has to be in that context. Now, you know, we, we're all discussing how the lockdowns are going to end at a certain point in time. Uh, 
Uh, but what we need to realize, and you know, we can see this from the experience of countries who are ahead of India in the epidemic curve, uh, is that these social distancing measures will need to be in place for a lot longer uh, after the lockdowns end. And you can see the case of countries like you know, Korea, which have managed to flatten the curve, uh, but the social distancing measures continue. Now, how long those social distancing measures continue, I mean, that will potentially need to continue for as long as you know, the world discovers a vaccine or there is herd immunity. Um, what that means essentially is that you know, even after the uh, impact of the lockdown, uh, there will be knock-on effects to consider because uh, you know, as you all have discussed, uh, you know, there's a risk of sudden stop in cash flow for firms, there's a bankruptcy risk, household risk, you know, in terms of income, job loss, food security, banks face the issue of non-performing uh, loans uh, going up. So if you look at the cumulative economic impact, while the peak economic impact is going to be in the April to June quarter, subsequent quarters are also likely to be quite weak. And it's going to take a long time uh, for the economy to actually get back to normal. Uh, so when we are constructing macro policies for India, it has to be in this uh, context. Now, you know, we do look at a lot of other Asian countries also in terms of the economic impact and, you know, what the macro policy response uh, is. Uh, and one thing that really stands out is uh, India's approach. I mean, first of all, just purely in terms of the monetary versus fiscal policy, clearly the monetary policy side in India has been very aggressive. Uh, the fiscal package that has been announced so far uh, would actually be one of the lowest uh, of all the countries uh, we track in uh, Asia, X, Japan. So clearly there is a need to step up more on uh, the fiscal policy response. Uh, the other difference uh, we see really is in the approach. Uh, so a lot of countries have a very direct approach to uh, intervention. So you have governments which have you know, set up uh, special purpose vehicles directly giving guarantee, directly giving loans to SMEs, uh, central banks which who are sort of going down the risk curve in terms of, uh, you know, buying different uh, assets. Um, India's approach actually has been more indirect uh, in terms of getting banks to do it, you know, let banks lend, let banks invest in you know corporate papers or nbfc papers etc now the issue is that you know we entered this shock with a very weak fiscal and banking balance sheet and because you have you know rising credit risk premium along with a capital shortage relying on the banking system to do the job uh, may actually lead to a lot of leakages in transmission so i think uh, one thing India should consider doing is really fine tuning and a more direct approach to policy response, i.e., you know, government puts in some liquid uh, equity, leverages it up, uh, sets up an SPV, directly gives that uh, loan to an SME so that the SME can survive, perhaps with a conditionality that the SME needs to keep the employees on board. Similarly, you know, RBI buying assets other than, uh, you know, government bonds, uh, for instance. But there are many other things, uh, for instance, uh, India can do. Uh, for instance, you know, corporates need more cash flows uh, right now. So, you know, tax dues can be postponed. Some of the fixed costs that uh, companies bear, whether it's on wages or on rent, that's something that governments can actually share uh, with the companies. Utility costs can come down. So, uh, you know, there's a lot that can be done uh, on uh, both fiscal and monetary, but I think broadly our approach needs to be a lot more direct. Uh, now, there are concerns about how the fiscal deficit will be funded. You know, what does it mean, uh, you know, in terms of India's uh, rating uh, outlook? I think there are various ways uh, the deficit can be funded. A lot of suggestions have come through in terms of the Reserve Bank of India itself intervening. Uh, you know, I, I think even in the secondary market, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, for instance, can be a lot more uh, aggressive. Uh, India could consider issuing, you know, tax-free COVID bonds for uh, retail uh, investors, uh, for instance. Uh, and as far as the rating threat is concerned, I think one lesson we've clearly learned from the COVID shock is that we didn't build in, build in enough buffer uh, in the FRBM escape clause. Uh, and therefore, a complete review of the fiscal rules uh, is clearly uh, necessary so that a more credible game plan, which is ultimately what is, uh, you know, what 
all investors want, uh, what rating agencies want, uh, we can actually present that uh, credibly then. Uh, back to you, Shekhar. Thank you, Sonal. Uh, yes, I think, uh, uh, and this is a question that we should probably come to, that there are things that the current conditions reveal. These are uh, uh, fault lines in our laws or regulations that we simply were not aware of. But uh, the FRBM certainly stands out as one that we probably need to address uh, very soon after we are out of this crisis. Let me turn to uh, Shantanu uh, from Reliance uh, on his sense of how industry is uh, looking at the next few months and uh, how both in manufacturing but also in oil and gas and other areas we are uh, we are preparing ourselves for what is happening and what will happen in the next few months. Thank you very much, uh, NCAR and Dr. Shah, for having me on the panel. Um, I wanted to start from what, where Sona left, and she mentioned a couple of very, very important points. One is that credit is not flowing, and banks are being asked to uh, take care of the credit flow. I think the first uh, reflection of that is where you are on the term premium on the government bond yield curve. So if you consider where you are in the cycle today and where the yield curve therefore should be, the term premium is probably at uh, the highest we have seen in the last five years or so. So even from an average perspective, you would be much, much higher. So given the cycle, first the government bond yield curve, the longer end needs to come down. No matter how much the RBI does on cutting rates or you know providing TLTROs, which I'm sure Avik will talk about, will not be helping until the longer end comes down. From there starts the spreads that ultimately corporates are paying or you know states are paying. So if you cannot control the spreads, which uh, you know will be a, a dynamic that the market will have to figure out, at least what the central bank can do is come out and be much more aggressive or active on the in the secondary market uh, while uh, you know how debt financing happens and uh, 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 and whether we talk about monetization or otherwise uh, what is the lever that you have in terms of the frbm escape clause those things come up so that's the first thing in terms of credit that corporates are facing the second is uh, part of what sajid touched upon and sonal both of them touched yeah. upon you know that the MSMEs are getting hit. You know that migrant labor is in the crisis today, right? Now, that has a very direct bearing on uh, supply chain linkages back home in terms of the companies operating. So if you see, uh, if you see transportation, people focus a lot on trucks and you know, whether the truck is running or not. But uh, the, the main activity in terms of you know, even when trade recovers will be the loading and unloading of of the trucks. That in India, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately because you know, it crowds in a lot of labor force, unfortunately because it is not enough mechanized yet, is still completely dependent on manual labor. So that's the first supply chain problem that you're facing. The second is that transportation works on the concept of back freighting. So even if you are to imagine the situation after a month or two months, when the economy opens up, uh, you will have pockets of COVID, uh, in, in intense COVID red zones, and there'll be some green zones. Now imagine the green zone produces, and you have a truck running from the green zone into the red zone. You will not have any freight moving back, right? So that is already happening. Now bigger companies, so let's say Reliance Industries, is able to take care of this through, uh, through rail freight. Because in rail freight, you can control this much better. Uh, the government is giving some exemptions on the rail freight as well. But for forget about an MSME, even for a medium-sized company, this would be very, very difficult to access. The other option for you to do is uh, you know, pay the to and fro fare to the truck. Now, clearly beyond 400 uh, kilometers or so, this economics just does not work at all. So today, if you look at the COVID map of India, you'll find that pockets of north, a large part of west and south, are the red zones. Those are the big red spots. And the east and central to an extent is relatively uh, doing better. Now, you know that the production in India happens maximum on the, on the western front and it transports it to the east. 
So imagine the situation where even when the opening up happens, this is the issue that uh, transporters and corporates will be facing uh, going forward. Um, with, with respect to labor, the other uh, issue that we are facing, I mean, companies at large are facing a lot, is that labor usually uh, goes back to villages about April, end of April, you know, for, you know, celebration with the families, marriage, etc. Now, this tends to resolve itself by the end of May. Now you're facing a problem where some of the labor is locked in the cities, where who are the producing centers. They have not been able to go back. There's a section which has already gone back who do not want to come back. So even let's say, you know, blue sky scenario, you resolve everything by uh, mid May, right? So third, third May is what, what the target is right now. Let's assume for a moment that, you know, by mid May you've resolved most of this crisis and you know, you want to uh, have movement back. These guys who have stayed back in the cities might now want to go back to the villages. Two, the guys who are already in the villages, knowing what is going on in the cities, do not want to come back. Especially if it is a big urban center, they do not want to come back at all. So that is another challenge in terms of labor that, uh, that companies will be facing. The third challenge that we have seen on the supply chain front is um, uh, containers are getting uh, so the ports are getting blocked with containers right so typically you know port utilization rates are about 85 percent that's where you know uh, the operating efficiency between about 65 70 or to about 80 85 is at the max and beyond that uh, you know the efficiency tips now right now you're facing a congestion because you know the import containers are still staying there again you have a labor problem because you cannot unload even if you unload, who will be consuming that? So these are the challenges which will keep coming up for Indian industry, even when you open up. So you know, when you consider the exit uh, plan or the exit situation, uh, in terms of policy response, you know, a lot of times we tend to think about, you know, four lakh crore of fiscal stimulus, you know, this much of monetary stimulus, and stop there. I think the macro numbers we have to work out in terms of how much India can finance. But the solutions in this case out of the COVID crisis will be much, much more sector specific and micro. Uh, I think the, the one thing which I've learned is that if you have sector experts in terms of understanding you know, who the stakeholders are, uh, you know, what are the challenges on the ground that you face, I think that can work out much well. Uh, uh, of course, you know, economics will be all of us will be bothering about what the total size of the fiscal stimulus should be and you know how to finance it and so on but in terms of really especially you know to Sajid's point that you know since your space is so limited you know that your fiscal and monetary space is limited to make it work well you'll have to go down to uh, having sectoral responses from the stakeholders my leaving thoughts and you know we can probably take it up later on in the discussion is uh, take a step back and think COVID without a digital economy, right? Where would we have been today? So in terms of thinking about policy responses uh, in the future, I think a lot of this transformation, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, not just e-commerce, because we are seeing the e-commerce uh, proliferate, not just in, uh, uh, in cities, uh, but, you know, there's a, what we call a tier plus adaptation that is happening for e-commerce. We are sh seeing shifts in the demographic profiles of the guys who are, uh, you know, shopping, you know, the 30, 35 bracket is where e-commerce would pretty much stop. And now more and more older generations, older people are happy to come in and shop online. Grocery was very low penetration. It is doing much, much better today. Uh, but, you know, beyond, beyond that, there's a government service delivery also. So if you consider Supreme Court directing uh, the, the courts to go in for video uh, court sessions, that is the way government service delivery will uh, probably shape up over the next six months, one year. And then when we are thinking about policy responses and using uh, the fiscal response properly, uh, Jam Trinity comes to mind, right? So without, without that, you would not have been able to transfer the PM Kisan uh, money into the bank accounts so easily, even with your first fiscal fiscal tranche. So you need to think digital when you're thinking about the policy response uh, from here on. 
uh, I'll, I'll, I'll close there and maybe come back to this point later in the discussion. So you're pointing out, Shantanu, to an important uh, feature, which I hope we will all return to, uh, that in meeting the urgent needs of the economy, both on social protection, as well as reviving medium and small scale enterprises and providing succor to the vulnerable, uh, we need to be thinking about how to make India much more resilient and how to build in the processes that, as you said, will lead to a far more efficient public service delivery mechanism that allows, for example, the e-court system to function a lot better. Uh, pendency was already a problem, but you know, a two-month lockout is going to really create an even bigger problem in pendency in our courts. So there are just so many low-hanging fruit that can actually be uh, the silver lining to the cloud that we also want to get to. With that, let me turn to uh, Abik and his uh, overview and remarks on what the financial sector is doing and should be doing. Abik. Uh, yeah, I have the usual problems of going last, and especially after two macroeconomists have spoken, um, because um, you know, uh, uh, the solution to a lot of the macroeconomic challenges that we are facing happen to lie in, in the financial system and that impinges directly on banks. Uh, so um, I, I have no choice but to sort of echo what uh, some of the previous um, uh, speakers said, particularly uh, Sonal. Um, you know, the fact is that uh, there is hugely elevated risk in the financial system. And uh, for, uh, you know, for banks to lend in that kind of uh, you know, ele elevated uh, risk environment is, uh, is a tough task because um, uh, we are sort of coming, the, the, the COVID crisis hit us at a time when things were already pretty bad in terms of the economic slowdown. We hadn't, despite uh, some fairly significant reform initiatives, uh, been able to solve the NPL problem. We had a problem with the shadow banks who sort of do the typical sort of intermediation between uh, the banks and uh, the smaller entities like the MSMEs and the, the, the small borrowers. Uh, let me just sort of try and give you a broad sense of how you know banks are likely to behave in uh, as we sort of move out of this of the most severe phase uh, of the COVID impact. Uh, and get into a more into the into the phase of recovery, and clearly uh, there would be a reallocation of uh, the, their portfolios in the sense that banks would actively look for hedges, if you like, against COVID. So sectors like pharmaceuticals, healthcare, and so forth, uh, they would uh, get uh, you know much more attention in terms of um, you know, seeking avenues to lend, whereas if you just sort of pull, tend to pull out of sectors like civil aviation, hospitality, and, and the ones that are most directly uh, hit by, by COVID. Uh, the second uh, thing that could happen as we sort of go forward is, to, is for uh, banks and financial um, institutions in general uh, to look for, uh, and this is really the long view, to look for um, uh, what the sort of implications of a possible real realignment in, in global supply chains uh, could mean in terms of lending opportunities. For instance, if there's a shift away from China, you know, driven both by the need to de-risk and also because of, you know, partly political factors. Uh, which are which are the sectors in India that could potentially benefit, uh, and there will be a continuing flight to uh, quality, where, and, and quality is often sort of proxied by size. So you would have the big firms taking away uh, the lion's uh, share of the credit, and, and and the smaller firms continuing to get uh, short shrift. Uh, so I come back to uh, some of the solutions that. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, uh, in the banking world uh, have been asking for, and one of them is, you know, I think Sadia mentioned it right at the beginning, is that we do need some guarantee on on our losses um, uh, to 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 lend to sectors 
that are potentially uh, risky and could sort of lead to a further escalation in NPLs, how these guarantees could be structured, what the exact sort of uh, you know, collaboration between the government and the central bank would be, uh, can be sort of discussed uh, in detail later. But that's, we need to have the government, I mean, the, the, the policy block, if you like, the combination of government and central banks ensure that a lot of sectors that have very obviously elevated risks are actually bankable. And I think that is really uh, the, the, the policy prescription that bankers would provide uh, in order to sort of create the environment for a safe and sustainable uh, exit. Uh, I would like to end by actually, I, I think that the, the phrase silver linings was mentioned in the a uh, brief description of our of the agenda uh, today, and I just want I just thought of some you know silver linings uh, pertaining to the to the financial sector and banking. One is that we we actually do have a a playbook uh, uh, in, in some sense, and it will have to be uh, modified and uh, you know tailored to the current situation. But I think the great financial crisis left us with a playbook uh, in terms of what kind of you know, policy initiatives uh, on the financial side that can be taken. And a lot of what we are talking about now is sort of an extension of what uh, were the, the tools that we used to fight the great financial uh, crisis of 2008. Uh, the second um, uh, silver lining, well, uh, silver, yeah, yeah, silver lining that, we, that I see uh, is the fact that we do have a reasonably healthy uh, financial sector uh, in part. So you have a number of very uh, well-capitalized large banks or who are not going to be affected if their margins are, get compressed for a couple of quarters or they face a deceleration in uh, credit demand. Uh, and you know, th and this can be sort of pushed forward in terms of policy, uh, in, in bringing about greater consolidation, uh, you know, privatization, etc., to sort of bring the efficiencies uh, that some of these players uh, still enjoy to the entire uh, system. And I think it's also perhaps time uh, we created a more robust. Uh, a platform for uh, small borrowers, uh, companies, uh, etc., to to borrow uh, and also to devise uh, you know financial instruments that are uh, that, that that go beyond the traditional credit function of funding working capital needs or whatever, but also sort of uh, acting partly as an insurance against some of these shocks and 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 creating sort of a, a, a an alternative. Uh, channel, uh, if you like, uh, initially sort of backstop perhaps by the government, uh, but uh, which would sort of ensure a sort of healthy flow of uh, capital uh, going forward. So these are these are my sort of concluding thoughts. Thank you, uh, Abhik. Um, um, all of you have laid out a very complex and difficult agenda and difficult time for policymakers. Uh, that lies ahead. Um, what I want to do is to invite you now to perhaps think a little bit about the institutional framework within which some of these policy decisions can be taken. Some of you have referred to the need for states to take the initiative in areas, particularly in health infrastructure, etc. Um, you've also talked about the need to coordinate uh, amongst the various policy making apparatus in the country to be able to prioritize the very limited fiscal resources that we have. Uh, so there are these institutional challenges that we probably have not confronted. Uh, one of you used the term war footing. Um, this is actually an incredibly difficult and much more complex environment than what a country goes through in a, in a, uh, in a confrontation of a military nature, simply because everyone is affected, not just those at the borders or not just the populations at risk. So uh, maybe we could think a little bit about that. And if I could get your sense of how 
the policymakers and governments and those who support governments, maybe even like think tanks like us, uh, should be worrying about, uh, and I'm going to be very specific, you know, the next 12 days or whatever is left of the current lockdown period. The lockdowns are an incredible opportunity to gear up. Uh, they, of course, flatten the curve and they you know, shift the peak out uh, for epidemiological events like this. But they're also extremely precious. Every minute of a lockdown is very precious because the cost is so high. And so you want to make sure that when you come out of it, you are as well prepared as you can be. So maybe if I could turn and just go back into the same order and say, in the next 12 days, what are some of the key things that we should be doing? Sajid? Uh, Shekhar, uh, as, as is to be expected, a great question, and it's not a trivial question. Well, I think first and foremost, um, uh, to, to start with, I, we, we will need to see unprecedented levels of cooperation, which we are seeing, and coordination uh, between fiscal authorities and monetary authorities, uh, between the center and the states who are at the front lines of this fight. So, you know, one of the advantages that India has is that uh, given the reported testing that we have, the, the proliferation seems to be very geographically concentrated. India has, you know, close to 700 districts. And I think at last count, it was, you know, only 150 districts. So they're about, uh, they're about that had more than 10 cases. So to the extent that that same phenomenon holds true going forward, India is slightly better placed to start off a uh, kind of to open up on a geographical basis where the hotspots still remain closed. Uh, and the rest of the country uh, slowly begins to open up. This is not a binary, it's not a switch that you turn or turn off, it's a continuum. And as China experienced, uh, these will have to be local decisions, they'll have to be dynamic decisions, we'll have to go from the state to the district, uh, to the local ward, and you know, close and open and close and open as local authorities deem fit. But we do have the advantage, uh, if you look below the aggregate numbers, that this is geographically very concentrated and so there is a natural way to think about how this should be open, notwithstanding all the concerns that Shantanu uh, rightly uh, laid out about, you know, if you've got closed districts and open districts, how do you think about supply chains, for example, moving? So I think that's one aspect. The second aspect is, you know, there's no substitute to testing, testing, testing. Now, we've seen India ramp up its testing capacity quite dramatically in the last month, but only when we have sufficient testing around the world, uh, uh, will there be confidence in knowing how widespread the uh, virus is uh, and whom we need uh, to actually quarantine, right? Uh, I like the Paul Romer approach, which is, you know, if this is going to be a long fight uh, and the balance to strike between lives and livelihoods is you test, 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 so you know exactly who to quarantine. Uh, number two, the vulnerable uh, 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 you know, I kept uh, uh, inside for a few months, uh, but there's a surge of personal protective equipment that young people are armed with as they get back to work. So I think all of these factors, hospital capacity, protective equipment, uh, testing, uh, ramping up testing, and the geographical opening up will be factors we have to focus on. I'll make a last point, which is more economics related, Shekhar, which is I think for fiscal and monetary, uh, what do we need to do? As we begin to open up, you will find that small medium enterprises, as an example, will see their working capital needs balloon because they've had to pay some level of cost over the last four to six weeks with virtually no revenues. So they're going, they're going to, their working capital needs will balloon. Now, precisely because their balance sheets are damaged, banks are going to be most reluctant to lend to these SMEs. In fact, if you look at the last five years, what's incredible is average credit growth, even before COVID, from India's banking system to the SME sector was essentially 0%. So there was a risk aversion even before that. This will simply be exacerbated by recent events. So the balance that policymakers will have to strike, fiscal and monetary working together, is to create adequate uh, backstops and incentives and first losses for banks to actually lend to SMEs so that a liquidity problem does not become a solvency problem. That said, there's a tension here. At the, at the other end of this pandemic, there will be some small medium enterprises that will not be economically viable. And there'll be opportunities in other sectors where some SMEs will have to come up. That normal creative destruction, that normal resource reallocation, we don't want to interfere with for efficiency reasons. So how do you provide liquidity in the near term 
be targeted, be temporary, be state contingent if possible, without interfering with resource allocation in the medium term? These are complex questions that policymakers will have to start answering before the economy opens up. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> the, the issue of uh, sorting that you referred to is going to be extremely important because the moral hazard that, of course, we face is going to be tremendous. Of course, most of us are just as, you know, we're thinking about the credit rating agencies. We actually don't want to worry too much about the moral hazard simply because of the vulnerabilities in our particular context that are involved. But Sonal, would you want to think a little bit about the policy making apparatus that A should be really functioning at, at, at top caliber at the moment? And then as we get into the long uh, haul of recovery, uh, whenever the lockdown is uh, over with, uh, and assuming that we don't have to lock down again, which of course is a big fear, uh, how should we think about, uh, not just at the center, uh, the fiscal and the uh, monetary policy work that's being done, but also the center-state relationship, which is going to be extremely crucial, because on the health side, a lot of the work will have to be done at the state level, and of course, there are going to be resource transfers, and the Finance Commission is very much going to be in the picture of how it actually formulates and reformulates its thinking of how state and center financial and fiscal relationships will pan out. Sona? Yeah, Shikhar, uh, I think, uh, you know, like you said, the next 12 days are uh, quite uh, crucial. Uh, and I think uh, it's not just the next 12 days, you know, the fight against virus uh, is going to be a constant fight. Uh, we've seen uh, countries, you know, put their guards down, assuming that, you know, the fight is over and we are planning for exit. Uh, Singapore is, before, Singapore uh, where you Singapore, are is clearly one. Singapore is a case in point. Uh, yeah. But this is, you know, something we've seen in the past as well, where you see multiple waves of this coming. So I think, you know, it's important to look at fiscal monetary policy, uh, but all of this will not be important if you're not able to contain the virus. So I think, you know, the priority has to be to ensure that, you know, the balanced strategy that we are trying to follow, which is, you know, keep the curve flat uh, while minimizing the economic cost. We do not lose sight of the virus curve because if we do, uh, we'll be forced to slam the brake again. So I don't think, first of all, the fight is over. And, uh, you know, over the next 12 days, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days, you know, the next two months, uh, as Sajid was saying, you know, significant ramp up of testing, uh, contact tracing, quarantine, using technology to try to, you know, find who's potentially vulnerable. A lot of this will have to be followed. So I think, you know, this has to be the number one priority. Uh, and we should not... Uh, let our guard down, uh, looking at uh, where the curve is right now. Um, second, you know, comes to uh, the macro policies and, as you said, the center-state relationship uh, uh, here. Uh, and I think, you know, while from a macro policy perspective, particularly, uh, while we uh, hope for the best, we have to prepare for the worst. And if this fight turns out to be a longer fight than we are anticipating, uh, then the bridge that will need to be provided to our companies, you know, our households, the daily wage laborers, to the banking sector, uh, the bridge to take them from today to when the virus ends will end up being a lot longer. Uh, so whatever is necessary in terms of providing the necessary liquidity, like I said, sharing some of the fixed costs uh, need to be done. Uh, and a game plan on that has to be ready uh, right away. Uh, and given a lot of this requires uh, state level uh, resources, states, uh, you know, are facing a lot of challenges, uh, both in terms of more expenditure and uh, lower revenues, uh, you know, from real estate to lower petroleum revenues, etc. So, uh, you know, a, the amount states can raise uh, and the limits that are currently imposed on states uh, these are clearly extraordinary times and the relaxation of those, uh, you know, limits, fiscal borrowing limits on states uh, needs to be given to them, uh, given the current uh, circumstances. Uh, perhaps the RBI can uh, increase even further the amount of, you know, sort of 
temporary overdraft ways and means advances that states can uh, take uh, from them uh, or you know the uh, center itself plays a bigger role in uh, garnering more funds and then sharing it uh, with uh, states but a uh, clearly greater coordination between center and states uh, not just in the fight against the virus but also in the economic fight uh, is quite crucial right now and and that could be one of the silver linings indeed if there is a framework that emerges whether it's the interstate council or some other form of center state uh, coordination gst council is obviously a case in point uh, but something that could actually endure well beyond the crisis would be very very important and could be one of the institutional gains that we make uh, from the current crisis uh, that we are uh, dealing with um uh, <clears throat> shantanu would you want to come in and uh, talk a little bit about the institutional framework that we should be looking at whether it's uh, sector specific or whether it is center state whether it's industry and government or industry and uh, the external world thoughts on that sure i think it will have to be a combination of uh, all, all of that all of that uh sajid and sonal have uh, mentioned very very relevant points uh if you ask me you know next 12 days whether it happens at a uh, at a pmo level or at the cmo levels of different states you need to identify your red zones and even if a city uh, a top city is not in a red zone just dependent on the population density you've got to identify that as red and isolate that for the next 15 20 days or whatever the rest of the economy opens up so if you think about it in terms of manufacturing let's say and you say that it's about whatever 20 22% out of gdp uh, you'll find that core cities the metro cities are not producing as much in terms of large factories being housed there so if something opens up in the outskirts that is fine but the core city is much more contributing to services large part of which is already happening through work from home uh, arrangements so again you know coming back to the digital economy right so if you look at you know tcs uh, what they have said in their earnings uh, earnings call by 2025 they want to get it to 25% of their work from pretty much staying at home and rotating that on a regular basis so if services can continue during this period and large part of it is already continuing let that continue the large cities do not need to get into uh, you know direct direct interaction in terms of transport and travel uh, what i'm missing out obviously is a, a large section who are still engaged with the smes and those operate in cities as well for that you need the backstop and that's where the liquidity point uh, you know my sense is that there's a there's something else that needs to come before liquidity so for instance if you're providing liquidity to the banking system and you say that i'm going to give you a backstop to lend to the smes risk aversion is not going to go because the clarity on the top line of the sme is not there forget about the bottom line right so that will start once the fiscal response first comes in without a fiscal response more of liquidity is not going to solve the problem if you look at the banking system today it's sitting on you know record levels of liquidity surplus but nobody wants to go down the risk curve it's a point that you know sona has already mentioned avik has already talked about so before you inject or you think about i'm i'm not i'm not saying that liquidity is not important of course it is important and, and the liquidity surplus needs to continue but before you inject more liquidity you need to think about a fiscal response which will get the top line moving in certain mm-hmm. smes mm-hmm. uh the third thing i would say is uh, engage very very heavily with the private sector uh, uh and and you know policy institutions to set up capacity in core industries and healthcare being one of them right so you engage with the private sector you set up capacity which will take care of it you know 3 months down the line because this is not going to go away right so you know as as people start moving back into you know jobs and regular interaction you'll have another spike and you'll need uh, you know the hospital operators at that point of time there's a lot of very smart innovation that is going on uh, companies are modifying uh, their production lines to cater to this 
Uh, I know for a fact that uh, you know Reliance has been doing a lot in terms of face masks. They are doing quite a bit in terms of PPEs. I know a number of auto companies who have already moved into you know manufacturing uh, ventilators. So these solutions need to keep going. So that needs to continue on a war footing. And then you need to isolate and figure out sectors which need very local solutions. Uh, by local, I don't just mean in a particular state, but uh, which is very, very sector specific. So the, the, the logistics part that I mentioned earlier is frankly, uh, you know, it's, it's a very specialized thing which the guys who are working in that sector will be knowing. So you need to engage with a wide variety of very specialized audience and then that needs to feed in into you know probably a body like Niti Aayog who's uh, having these uh, multiple channels of communication and then probably also through the different ministries which feeds into the master body which then takes care of uh, with, which then takes the decision so while the allocation of 3 4 lakh crore 5 lakh crore of stimulus is is important uh, how you prioritize that over the course of the next 15 days and then you know two months will be uh, equally important, if not more. Thank you, uh, Shantan. Uh, have we done enough uh, in the first phase of the lockout and the uh, days into the second lockout that we have uh, been experiencing? And I, 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 we've done a lot. So there can really be no other response to that question that the government has tried to do the best we can. But have we done enough? Uh, given the nature of the crisis and the challenges that we are facing. And that's a question I want to come to, but let me ask Abik to round out this sort of institutional framework priorities discussion uh, and then open it up also to answering questions from our participants, but also just the, the, the four of you uh, perhaps uh, 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 engaging with each other. Abik? No, I'm just going to actually respond to the, uh, the question that you just raised is, uh, on, on whether we've done enough. And I think if you uh, look at the two phrases that have uh, kind of described and characterized the policies in the G7 world, which have been aggressive indeed, and some of the emerging markets uh, which are well ahead of the curve in terms of their policy responses, these two phrases would be uh, unconventional measures and uh, do whatever it takes. I mean, I mean you know, the, the two uh, you know, the, the, the descriptions of, of uh, <coughs> potentially successful policy. And I think we uh, appear, we might appear to have done uh, quite a bit, especially on the Montreal front. But I think if I were to take these two as um, kind of uh, the, the, the barometers of uh, the adequacy of policy. Uh, I, I don't think we've either uh, used an, um, uh, enough unconventional tools, neither have we done whatever it takes. So I think in over the next few days, uh, we need to think of um, putting together a policy framework uh, that ticks these boxes. And, and uh, my suggestions again would be on the monetary policy side, uh, let's just go beyond uh, liquidity, which is a very, very conventional kind of measure, but liquidity doesn't um, alleviate uh, the, uh, risk aversion or uh, uh, the, the perception that um, you know, a lot of companies can easily go into bankruptcy. So we need perhaps direct buying from the RBI uh, starting with perhaps a good quality paper, but they might even want to go down uh, the quality ladder in order to ensure that uh, companies have enough access to credit. On the fiscal side, again, uh, well, in, in terms of actual response, it's been, uh, I, I would describe it as tepid, largely a relief measure in terms of percent of GDP, fairly small. Uh, you know, going forward, I just hope uh, I, I, because I think a lot of it is about instilling confidence that uh, we are doing enough to uh, enable a recovery whenever um, it, it, is, it is possible in, uh, in terms of not endangering uh, lives and so forth. Uh, that we're do, putting enough uh, you know, policy measures in place, both 
you know, direct action and uh, sort of contingent action in the form of guarantees and uh, so forth, so that uh, the uh, di different stakeholders of the economy are convinced that uh, we are in uh, safe and fairly, uh, and in this context, safe uh, would also have to be very aggressive. Uh, so, uh, you know, safe and aggressive policy hands, if you like. And I think that's that's very critical. But the, the last point that I wanted to make is, as we've talked a bit about testing, is yes, I think we need to ramp up testing uh, exponentially. But I think we need to, since we are talking about uh, a sustainable economic growth path coming on the back of some kind of uh, stable labor force that doesn't have to be so withdrawn whenever there is some kind of escalation of uh, the infection, uh, the second wave comes and so forth. Uh, I, I think we need to be very clear about what we are trying to get out of the testing data. And is there, uh, are there sort of calculated gambles uh, that we can take given uh, what the testing, um, the, the test results uh, provide us? For instance, I think the phrase, uh, herd immunity was mentioned. So if we do have a fairly high asymptot uh, asymptomatic uh, rate can we sort of um, you know protect the vulnerable those the elderly and those with uh, comorbidities and let sort of the healthy young workforce actually start working even with the high risk of it these are very very uh, crucial policy choices which uh, lie on the cusp of uh, you know health policy epidemiology and economics but this is the kind of uh, crisis that uh, need all hands on, on deck and a sort of a collaboration between the two and uh, the resolution of the possible tensions uh, between you know, different uh, policy uh, views and, and objectives. Let's take some questions from our uh, uh, participants and I'm just going to choose a few. Um, there's a question to uh, Sonal and to Sajid. Uh, either of you are free to, to take it. What, what would be the pros and cons of RBI monetizing the fiscal deficit, say something the order of 2 to 3% of GDP? Um, and how much is the scope for RBI to cut the repo rate further? This obviously also is in a peak territory. So, Sonal, do you want to take a stab at that uh, question in terms of the pros and cons on monetizing? So the pro is clearly, I mean, given uh, the significant fiscal slippage uh, center and state and the additional market uh, borrowing that will it will lead to, uh, the main advantage of the RBI directly monetizing will be there is no excess supply. So the risk of sort of interest rates shooting up substantially, uh, you know, is sort of uh, reduced. And that's important because if the, you know, government bond yields go up, i.e. your risk-free rate itself is shooting up, then the cost actually goes up for uh, all other borrowers. So that's the uh, biggest uh, advantage. Uh, in terms of the disadvantages, I mean, uh, there are uh, two. Uh, one is that, uh, I mean, there's a reason why it has, you know, we've had these rules to, uh, you know, keep uh, the Reserve Bank of India out uh, of directly monetizing the fiscal deficit. I mean, the fear has been it essentially leads to, you know, excess spending, unproductive spending, uh, and uh, uh, disincentivizes uh, the right uh, behavior. Um, and uh, the second uh, risk would be if, uh, you know, this leads to higher inflation uh, over a period of time, uh, and that itself can lead to a lot of macro imbalances, you know, worsening, it can show up in currency weaknesses, etc. Now, you know, the thing is, a lot of the disadvantages don't necessarily, you know, happen immediately. Um, uh, so I think, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there is no right answer. <laughs> of whether this is the right way to go or not. So, you know, a fairly deliberated, coordinated uh, call uh, will need to be taken between the RBI and the uh, government. Uh, hey, uh, Sajid, do you want to take a, a quick look at that question as well? Well, just to say that, you know, um, when I spoke about constraints in emerging markets, uh, this is where monetary authorities face one of them. Because remember where uh, and I talk about absorptive capacity. Remember where interbank liquidity is. I mean, 
at last count, banks were depositing almost 7 lakh crore uh, with the central bank. And then there was another 1 lakh crore of uh, announcements made last week. So we're looking at the system having an you know, 8 lakh crore a surplus. Now, if the RBI were to monetize it, and I don't disagree with Sonal, these are exceptional times. You may see this as a last resort in many emerging markets. Um, that interbank liquidity surplus, whether the deficit is directly monetized or monetized through open market operations, could shoot up into 10, 11, 12 lakh crore. Now, what happens when you've got such a glut of liquidity is monetary policymakers tend to lose monetary control. I, I want to avoid getting too technical here, but the, the interbank rate that really matters, the TREPS rate where most interbank transactions happen, was already trading between 2 and 3% for the most part last month. In part because there was so much liquidity, it was trading below the bottom of the RBI's corridor. Right? And, and, and so uh, if there's even more liquidity pumped in, the interbank rate may head you know, even lower, and that reduces degrees of freedom for monetary policy going forward. So this is what I mean by absorptive capacity constraints in emerging markets. I'll just end by saying one thing. Uh, you know, I think the deficit monetization uh, and I think fiscal monetary coordination is not a binary and doesn't necessarily mean only coordination. There are many other things that fiscal monetary can coordinate together on. For example, what you saw in the last week, overdraft facilities for center and states going up. So center reduces its, uh, so states reduce their market borrowing. But it's another important element here uh, uh, that some kind of regulatory forbearance to banks could also make it easier for higher levels of market borrowing to go through. What do I mean by that? Despite having massive liquidity, banks are so fearful about the mark-to-market -market risk of buying dated securities that banks are not buying duration. So before we get to the RBI, the first thing we need to do is uh, get a kind of create more risk or, or appetite of the banks if they aren't lending to the real economy, at least buy long-dated government bonds. And so you may need to see some forbearance on how mark-to-market -market risk is treated. So there are different avenues you can go down before we reach the deficit monetization question later. Abhik, uh, there was this uh, comment made by one of you about over-dependence on the banking system rather than direct action by the fiscal authorities uh, in uh, the kind of protection for uh, SMEs as well as obviously for uh, households. Uh, from the banking sector, what's your view? Uh, well, I think uh, banks can sort of um, fill this uh, role uh, to a certain extent if we do get uh, what we've been sort of discussing all this while, the first loss guarantees and so forth, so that there is uh, some backstop uh, to the uh, to the sort of the uh, fanning out of uh, the, the risk associated with a particular <laughs> with a particular loan to. Um, a small uh, company or whatever. But I think um, um, the issue came up because despite this, that there, there, there will be uh, some degree of risk aversion. I mean, risk is so elevated uh, that it is, uh, I, I think even if banks were to get uh, these backstop, these guarantees and so forth, uh, I, I don't think we will get the optimal amount of credit flow that is needed in the system. So perhaps one solution, and this is something that the U.S. has done, is for a quasi-bank, a special purpose vehicle with equity support from the Treasury, which is then leveraged by the central bank to lend directly. Uh, banks can you know, fill, uh, fill, the, fill the gap to a certain extent if they get what they're asking for, which is uh, some way to de-risk their loans. But I don't think that will be enough given the magnitude of this crisis. So then we move into the domain of the unconventional, as I mentioned, which, is, which are these uh, quasi sort of bank type instruments, which is they're really sort of joint ventures between the exchequer and the central bank. Pardon me, my mic was muted. Uh, Shatru, there was this question about financing the current account and uh, the dollar impact on balance sheets. That's something in Treasury that you worry about on an hourly basis. What's your sense of what is ahead of us? Well, thankfully, in, in this whole uh, you know, doom and gloom macro scenario, oil prices have been lower, right? 
and that is uh, sort of saving the day for India on the current account. Uh, so, I mean, forecasts are ranging between, uh, you know, anything between a slight minor positive current account surplus to maybe about half a percent, uh, 2.7% of deficit. So that will be about 15 to 20 uh, billion odd dollars. Uh, so just in terms of the math, about $20 of oil price decline will uh, save us about roughly $30 billion. So that's the ballpark math. Uh, $10 is about $15, uh, $15 billion on the on the current account. Uh, on the So that, that's on the trade side, but you know, one of the things that will hit India uh, and this is again about the exit strategy is given where oil prices are and given the number of migrants that you have from especially South India to the Gulf, your remittances will slow down with a lack. That is one. But more importantly, these guys will be out of jobs. So expect an influx once the air travel opens up and these guys will want to fly back home without a job. Uh, without having the ability to possibly remit money. So I do not know what, you know, the Gulf countries will get into given, you know, where their current account and fiscal balances are going towards. Uh, you know, a, a country like Saudi Arabia can uh, tap into their uh, sovereign wealth fund, but all of them uh, do not have uh, recourse to such, uh, uh, such you know, uh, fund money. Uh, so that is one thing that we'll have to worry about. Uh, secondly, from the capital flow side, See, you know, it'll be a little bit of uh, who's the uh, brightest out of the uh, up the ducklings, right? Uh, so when you consider the emerging market complex, and this is where Sajid and Sonal can come in again, uh, you know, it'll be the relative growth differential which India offers versus others, or the relative rate differential to an extent which India offers versus others. And policymakers will have to think about uh, about those things, especially for the fixed income markets when they consider something like uh, monetization of deficit. So that's where the capital flows angle will come in. Uh, you know, FDI should be, uh, you know, it will come down, but, you know, should be enough to sort of uh, take care of the amount of current account deficit we should be having this year. So thankfully, we don't have a twin deficit problem now. Uh, I think the deficits are, I mean, the, the problems are much more contained in the local macro space. Uh, just one word on the, uh, on monetization, uh, you know, we talk about where the liquidity will ultimately get to if, you know, RBI comes in more more heavily. I, I want to come back to the term premium question, right, which I had raised earlier. Mm -hmm. if, if the market doesn't have clarity in terms of what the central bank is. So all of us know that we are in a tough fiscal situation, right? And, you know, even before COVID-19 hit us, everyone knew that fiscal was in uh, not great shape, right? Now, the fiscal overhang on the bond markets is always going to be there. Now that you have hit COVID-19, you're in an even deeper stress. If you do not give clarity, and if you know you, you do policy by packets, then you will never ever get your term premium down, no matter how much of rate cuts you might be uh, doing in the in the shorter end. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the question was more on you know where can repo go? Sure, mm -hmm. I mean you know 50 basis points more, 75 basis points more. The RBI could cut, keep cutting, but your term premium will never come down. If it doesn't, the issue with the real economy is that everyone else gets priced off the government bond curve, mm -hmm. and that is something that uh, you know of course you know uh, there's no free lunch, so there are costs to each of the policy decisions that you uh, undertake, but. Uh, it, it really, really is worth considering uh, right now where you want your term premium to be, given the stage in the cycle. Yeah, that's, that's uh, very important. Sanjit? Well, just two things to what uh, Shantanu was saying. You know, I'll just take the, the last part. I understand what Shantanu was saying in terms about term premium and fiscal uncertainty. But, you know, I, I would empathize with policymakers on this front. There's just so much uncertainty in terms of the shock that we can't possibly conceptualize what the impact is going to be on the fiscal, let alone new expenditure. You know, it'll be uh, hard press for anyone to say what the revenue impact is going to be. I mean, when the U.S. Fed doesn't give you forecasts for where the U.S. economy is going, it tells you the quantum of uncertainty that we're operating under. So I think it's not realistic or reasonable to expect policymakers to say 
this is our fiscal deficit and no more because it, this is uh, this is unprecedented. Uh, we won't know till much later what the growth shock is, what the revenue shock is, or how the automatic stabilizers on the budget play out, both on the revenue side and the expenditure side. I, I think all we can do at this point is, uh, 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 you know, signal to markets about how expansive otherwise the response is going to be. But let me just one make quick one quick point. You know, people conflate 2020 for 2013. Right, and Shantanu makes a very important point. This is a very different situation for India compared to 2013. There, the rupee was the worst performing currency. We were overheating. The current account deficit was at 6% of GDP. Let's not conflate the two situations. Our external sector has improved dramatically. We expect the current account to be in modest surplus. But also, if you look at uh, gross external financing requirements in India as a function of reserves, they're half the level they were in 2013. So there are far more buffers on the external sector now than there were back then. This is not a question of external imbalances, it's a question of you know growth and how quickly you get that up. And I'll end by saying this ultimately goes back to what Sonal was saying, that all of this you know, capital outflows, fiscal response, economic growth shock will come down to how quickly we can contain COVID. The faster we do it, uh, the more uh, salutary the impact will be in all these other macroeconomic variables. Yeah, I think that's uh, the big question. And that goes back to the testing and the differentiated isolation strategies that we adopt. Abhik, uh, do you uh, want to pick up uh, 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 any of the questions? There's one, by the way, that was intriguing. And you mentioned the Middle East, but uh, the question here on what's going to be the impact of the Trump immigration ban and potential decline in remittances. I, it, it may be the case that in any case, the remittances from these developed markets may be drying up simply because of precautionary savings going up in those countries themselves amongst the non-resident Indians. Abhi, do you have any sense of how this might play out? Um, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I understand that it's only for 60 days and uh, I'll just, we'll have, just have to uh, look at the fine print of uh, this executive order. Uh, there, I, I, I saw a couple of tickers on uh, uh, the, the news channels that it will not affect uh, Indians, H1B uh, visa holders. I, I really don't know what is going on. I suspect this is, if it is indeed a temporary um, uh, curb, uh, it should not have a permanent impact. But that said, I, you know, across the world, incomes will get press more so in the oil producers where we have a large presence of our diaspora so in terms of you know projecting the balance of payments or uh, you know building strategy for uh, current account uh, management i think we could uh, work with a significantly reduced i think we've uh, said for the moment lost you uh, maybe you will reconnect in a minute. Uh, Sonal, do, do we are about uh, just five minutes from the close of our program. So I wanted to ask you, Sonal, how do we compare uh, to our uh, neighbors on the east, where of course you are? Uh, and as Asia is gearing up for this and going through uh, the same crisis, though at a scale much smaller than ours, do you see obvious points of comparison between us and uh, where you are? Yeah, Shekhar, I think, you know, as uh, Sajit and Chantu were saying, on the external finances front, actually India looks uh, reasonably stable. Uh, in fact, the, you know, countries like Indonesia, maybe Malaysia would be more vulnerable. Uh, but uh, what uh, worries me really is our vulnerability on the financial sector, uh, which was at least not as apparent uh, and as weak uh, back in 2013. And the question is, you know, what kind of an economy, what kind of a financial sector will we have a year from now? And, uh, you know, some of the countries in East Asia have had their uh, rapid uh, growth phase. Uh, we have not. Uh, we need to, we are getting into, a, uh, and, you know, one of the other consequences of, you know, depressed income, as Abhik was mentioning, will be a risk of a more deglobalized uh, world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what is our game plan to grow, create jobs in such a, in, in such a global uh, growth environment? I think uh, 
uh, that is uh, the biggest uh, sort of medium term game plan uh, that we need to have uh, and one of the preconditions for that uh, is to have a very strong financial sector uh, and uh, you know to rank very high on ease of doing business so you know once we uh, you know take care of sort of the survival uh, you know game plan uh, that we have to focus on right now uh, we need to then shift the gear and focus on the reconstruction uh, phase of growth uh, strategy uh, for uh, india and that reconstruction really should be uh, on a much smarter level of uh, of our laws of our regulations of the ability for business uh, and the state and the citizen to be engaged in a much more productive and potentially a much more uh, as you said an easier way of doing things i don't know if we've lost a week i hope he can rejoin we're almost at the very end of our uh, hour and a half i i want to close but i do want to ask shantanu uh, a little bit about what uh, his thinking is in terms of how we plan for ease of doing business how we plan for a kind of new economy that india is and can be in what as son says will potentially be a deglobalized world yeah sure so clearly we are going to see the end of us exceptionalism whichever way you look at it right so um i think opportunities for india even in traditional sectors will open up so you might see so while you are seeing this huge shrink in capital expenditure across different industries uh places where we have not uh, been very active in just because we were reporting our uh, we all of that that might become opportunities in the future the second thing is uh, clearly whatever strategy we look at from here on has to go digital you know because joined us back good good to have you back abhi yes go ahead shantanu yeah so uh, that that has to go digital uh clearly one very uh, pertinent disruption that we have seen during the covid period is uh, healthcare mm. so telemedicine is becoming very very active uh, in india already uh, there are video sessions which are going on uh, and i think that has to really really take off if you are to reach to the village level as well so you know move out of tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 into rural and so on uh i think it also gives us the chance to uh, you know sort of correct education and health which we haven't done over the over the past you know uh, 50 70 odd years it it gives us a chance to take a look back now and uh, you know channelize public expenditure towards building capacities there okay um we're going to end but i want to give a big the last word and uh, a big that's fine we haven't touched on agriculture in any serious way in our conversation i don't know if you want to come in on that or if anybody else amongst the r4 panelists want to come in on that abik well my understanding is that at least uh, i mean uh, the saving grace is that uh, uh, the virus doesn't seem to have penetrated the hinterland in any significant manner i mean at, at least that's what the The, the tests uh, up to now show uh, so uh, b- uh, you know the rubby crop will be uh, you know harvested um, uh, somewhat efficiently uh, if if we sort of manage to allocate uh, labor uh, in in some sensible fashion because there is of course a pro- problem with reverse migration but that's for the villages so i don't don't think there will be a labor shortage problem uh and i think the entire focus of the the initial set of measures that the government took was to ensure that the uh, the, the rubby crop uh w- was kind of protected and uh, and and i guess that's one of the segments uh, the agriculture and the rural economy that might just be the, the other one of the other silver linings in an other uh, in this very dark, dark uh, story and uh, that could be uh, a, a sort of a source of demand we hear that the you know, tractor sales are still fairly healthy it it could it could drive uh, two wheeler sales 
uh, etc. When the leaderships uh, start reopening and so forth, so I would keep my eye on that uh, on that ball uh, because that seems to have been relatively insulated uh, from both the lockdown and uh, the virus impact. Okay, uh, Abhi, thank you very much. And with that, let me come to the end of this webinar. Uh, I want to thank all our panelists, uh, Sonal, Burma, and Singapore, with Domura. Uh, Shantanu Sen Gupta uh, at Reliance in Mumbai, uh, Sajid also in Mumbai, and JP Morgan. Thank you all for uh, your thoughts, your insights. Uh, I hope to uh, see this becoming a regular feature that we will try to uh, do in the course of the next few weeks, because I think the more uh, the insights we can bring to the fore, the stronger our policy response is hopefully going to be. I want to thank all the participants who joined us and all the questions that they put up. Um, this is really uh, NCER doing this for the first time. But as many of you have said, we're all adapting to a digital world. And I think the faster we adapt, the better off all of us will be. So with that, let me all wish you uh, a good night. And thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to the next such webinar where we hope to see you again. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.